Hey, what's up, y'all? This is Coach Skip Funday back at it once again. Kicking it for you and for yours. And this is part three of Liberia. What happened at their Choose Firestone? You know, if um, just for a quick recap, we went through what happened when they, um, in the beginning when they dealt with Marcus. They didn't really speak on Marcus there, but I interjected that in this, in this article, whatever, this essay. Well, what happened after they choose, you know, Firestone and what happened and how the um, part two got the well, how the Moravian Boule they just part of the name members of the Moravian Boule. And this one's gonna go a little bit more deeper into the um, Civil War part and the contract that Firestone signed with the warlord Charles Taylor. You know what I'm saying? And we're gonna go into that, you know? So, yeah. In July 1991, a top Firestone executive named John Shrimp traveled from Akron to Liberia. He was a chemical engineer who wound up as director of human services at Firestone corporate headquarters. In February 1991, the company's new Japanese management had made him head of the division overseeing a Liberian plantation. He had never been in Liberia or run a rubber farm. We'll get more into the Japanese management on sidebar. We'll get more into that. The novelty of Shrimp's trip, of Shrimp's trip was alluded in an online biography, which he recounted the start of his career at Firestone. Little did he know that 20 years later, his job would take him to Liberia, where in the middle of a country civil war, he'd be whisked at machine gun point into the jungle to meet their rebel leader. The rebel leader was Taylor. Shrimp and other corporate executives were just there first visited the plantation traveling in a sports utility vehicle with an armed guard. They passed through checkpoints banned by West African peacekeepers who Shrimp described as professional soldiers. Then the team passed into Taylor territory. There were checkpoints guarded by young boys with AK-47. We were shocked, Shrimp said in a written response to questions. On July 3rd, Shrimp got worried that Taylor wanted to meet him. Richardson's Taylor type advisor will lead them to the talks. The team traveled up crumbling highways and dirt roads, past soaring cotton trees, and listed motor butch of central Liberia before they arrived at the autocrat capital in Urbanga. From there, Shrimp and Stirrup were taken in a sprawling retreat that had been the former president's Tubman summer home. The visitors were escorted into a ballroom with parked up floors. A few minutes later, Taylor swept in. He sat in a chair that looked like a throne. For a few moments, Taylor minister complained to Shrimp and Stirrup that Firestone had abandoned his workers and had let Liberia down. Taylor held up his hand, Shrimp recalled, the minister stopped talking. He declared his desire for a new start with economic progress for all Liberians. According to the interviews, Taylor told executives that he wanted to Firestone back in business. To do so, Firestone wanted to deal exclusively with the Taylor government. All taxes will be paid to Taylor. All labor problems will go through his ministers. In effect, Firestone will treat Taylor government as an official government of Liberia, an economic, if not diplomatic, recognition that Taylor created to establish the legitimacy of greater Liberia. There was one thing that was clear. Emerson had to go. Taylor wanted an old acquaintance to take over. We, who retired to Firestone Plantation boss, who had dealt with Liberian politicians since the 1970s. Two days later, Shrimp indicated Firestone wanted this to accommodate Taylor. In a letter, he wrote that the company wanted Taylor's assistance and cooperation to clean up the plantation, resume services at the hospital, and get water and electricity running again. We found the discussions very enlightening and helpful, Shrimp wrote in a letter. He said he was confident that Firestone and Taylor rebel government have a common goal for the better future of Liberia and its people. We agreed that Taylor would be given permission to restart the plantation. Restart the plantation. And feed the employees and put them back to work. Certain writing in his written response. The company about face was complete. Before it had resisted the guerrilla leader who had killed his workers, threatened to execute his managers, and ravaged the country that long been his partner. Now, Firestone decided to acquiesce. Yes, absolutely, Patmore said. It was clear that without you, will not be able to put together a management team on the ground. Last stand for an old hand. 
Emerson was accepted at Firestone's no found willingness to cooperate. He had spoken with Firestone attorneys. They were worried about the potential legal problems, including breaking U.S. laws governing companies operating overseas. In the weeks after the July meeting, Emerson flew back to Akron to protest the change in direction. He said he met with several senior Firestone executives. He and Shrimp had a heated exchange. I stated that the position that we had had should continue to have, Emerson said. We should not recognize Taylor and his people as a legitimate government for the country of Liberia. I was very opposed to dealing with Taylor under his terms, Emerson said. Emerson said Shrimp had called him to the office and threatened to fire him. Emerson would not accept the dismissal letter. He said insisted on a mutual agreement in which he would not discuss the company actions in exchange for a buyout package. Shrimp consented. In October 1991, Emerson left Firestone. Shrimp did not respond to the request for comment on Emerson's account. Firestone responded to Emerson's assertion that his decision not to, to, to decision to work with Taylor had been a mistake. There were many options within Firestone regarding what direction the company should take. Management considered all points of view and finally the decision was made that they believed it was best for the company and its employees in Liberia, the company said in a statement. There were no good options. Firestone continued with his new approach, the change in the tax third apprehension in Morovia and Washington. While in Liberia, Shrimp had paid a lawyer Sawyer, a round-faced, gentle anti president who had long opposed Taylor. In recent interviews, Sawyer said he found Shrimp elusive when he asked about Taylor. Shrimp said he, Sawyer said he warned Shrimp about the consequences of cozying up to the warlord. We knew that Firestorm support could fuel the war. We didn't think it would be a good idea, Sawyer said. U.S. diplomats watched warily, and in September 1991, Firestone executives spoke with the State Department's officials in Washington. The diplomats warned the current company about the difficulties and dangers of doing business in Taylorland and the potential legal problems according to one cable. Firestone is reluctant to write off huge investments in Liberia, but show increasing frustration over the efforts to conduct business by the book, the cable continued. On December 17, 1991, almost two years after Taylor's invasion, the boards of directors met in Acre to discuss Taylor's demands. Shrimp delivered the presentation. In exchange for being able to return to its operations, Firestone will work with Taylor government, will make significant capital investments to restore plantation assets that have been damaged and looted, the company will, will return Oakland Land, Taylor's biggest port, into a viable entity. Firestone managers will also be allowed to reoccupy homes that Taylor ministers and his followers have taken over. The board, led by Chairman and CEO Yoshishura Kazazang, approved everything, Shrimp told Taylor in the letter. Firestone now, Firestone now, sidebar, Firestone now is now owned by the Japanese company Bridgestone. You know what I'm saying? So they, they bought them off. So the Japanese is involved now. You know what I'm saying? And they improved everything. They, they said it was a go. Firestone is a willing and willing to commit the time, money to do so, and respectfully request your assistance for us to move beyond forward together, Shrimp wrote. By doing so, we make a great contribution to Liberia. Shrimp closed his letter by wishing Taylor the piece of Christmas season and of hope for the new year. Hmm. Ain't that a bitch. On the very day the board in Akron voted to go on business with Taylor, his fighters were stealing Firestone trucks, looting nearby towns, and had in jail and tortured two hapless visitors, villages from Hop Harrow, a Firestone of business plantation told the U.S. Embassy. Memorandum of Understanding. On July, excuse me, January 18, 1992. Firestone consummated the deal with Taylor. Gail Ruff, Firestone acting manager at the time, headed to the Taylor's capital in Cabanga. He had been advised to bring beverages to celebrate the scene, signing on the memorandum of understanding between Firestone and Taylor's self-declared government. In Cabanga, several Taylor's top minister pretended Ruff with a text of memorandum. The details have been hashed out earlier between Trump and Taylor's representatives. Ruff affiliated his ascender to the accord. In a recent interview, Ruff said he was fuzzy on the event details, 
but a non-signing agreement won't fire Stone behalf. I had to be a little like Sergeant Schultz. I know nothing, he said, referring to the 1960s American sitcom in which the German prison guard constantly asserts his ignorance over sensitive matters. I was basically handed a fee at a comply. They needed a warm body on the ground to sign the papers. It was a remarkable document in annals of corporate history. On Taylor's stationery, which bore a scorpion print, the agreement laying out the preamble of the stakes. Taylor government wanted to improve the Liberian economy. Taylor Firestone wanted to resume operations of his rubber plantation. And to do so, Taylor will return with seized housing, return seized housing to Firestone managers and will provide security forces to protect Firestone workers. Firestone in turn will pay Liberian workers in US dollars and rehire employees that it had abandoned. Perhaps most important, Firestone will make all arrangements necessary for settlement of present and future obligations to the Taylor government. Firestone provided copies of, of, of the agreement to the U.S. Embassy and to the Office of Sawyer's Interim Government. Here's that memorandum right here called the Memorandum of Understanding. There go Taylor's print. The, you know, to see the scorpion right there. You know, so he basically got him in a contract. Got each other. Didn't you know what I'm saying? Firestone conduct business in full transparency. Firestone said this in a recent statement. The memorandum made it clear in public management determination to find a way to resume work on the firm and to keep it a viable entity for Liberia as well as with Firestone and his employees. At that time, Firestone signed a document there was still hope for peace, but those expectations crumbled in the following months. Democratic elections called for war by one peace pact in April 1992 never materialized. The horrors of civil war continued to mount. The U.S. State Department 1992 report on human rights violation found that 20 to 30,000 Libyans had died during the previous year, and more than 600,000 had fled their homes. Taylor Rebels had detained some 4,000 West Africans for months, the report said. In one country, they killed as many as 1,500 people, mostly Quran, the tribe that's in um, Liberia, and destroyed entire villages. They carried out clandestine killings, raped women, looped homes, and stole cattle. Firestone, Pat Moore said, was unaware of the scope of Toiler's violence. In 1991, I don't recall any reports of systematic widespread human rights abuses, Pat Moore said. The areas under Taylor control seemed to be relatively peaceful at that time. Firestone Soldier Arm. On May 22nd, at Firestone Historic Brick Headquarters in Akron, the company confirmed its commitment to work with Taylor. It was at 8.30, and there at 8.30, the company's second floor conference room, Kazazaki, the CEO and chairman and board chair, met with two representatives of Taylor's NPRAG government, according to Firestone corporate summary of the meeting. Kazaki, had assumed leadership a year earlier with strict orders to return, restore profitability to the company. He spoke little English at the time. Firestone, mostly Miss Western managers, referred to him as Kazaki san, a traditional Japanese horrific, honor fic. Kazaki told Taylor's man that he would be glad to return to Japan to spread the news that Liberia was under Taylor, was open for business so long as a fire plant was firestone plantation was running. In two brief phone interviews, Kazaki said he recalled Taylor's representative had come to Akron, but he did not remember meeting with them. He did dispute the meeting notes. He did not dispute the meeting notes. He referred further questions to the fireman spokesman. For public questions, Kazaki said were unpleasant. Kazaki made two promises before the events in Akron concluded. Firestone will use every possible effort to accelerate the startup of production and commencement of paying the taxes to the NPRAG. Second, he will fulfill Taylor's request. We will become the new plantation boss. Hmm. Five, money and menace. This right here is the Firestone plant. You know, one of the pictures of it going to coming in, you know what I'm saying? Um, plantation, just saying, you know. This is, this is one of the pictures coming into it. Like I said, it's about as big as Chicago. This is pretty big. 
Firestone money started flowing to Taylor in January 1992. That month, Firestone paid Taylor's government about $69,000 in income and reconstruction taxes, $10,000 for Social Security pension scheme, and $6,000 for Social Security income scheme, according to internal corporate documents. By the end of 1992, the records carefully rose in columns show that Firestone had paid more than $2.3 million in income taxes, Social Security pensions, workers' injury fund, and rent. Of that total, more than $1.3 million was paid in cash and check and about $1 million in contributions of rice, building, and equipment. The document also showed that Firestone poured $3.35.3 million into rebuilding the plantation between June 1990 February 1993. It is unclear whether the total includes tax payments. The document said the money paid for rice shipments, plantation rehabilitation, pensions, and labor settlements, and $12.3 million in miscellaneous obligation and expenses. Now, the $12.3 million in miscellaneous obligation and expenses, that should make you wonder right here. A big suck. In the coming years, Taylor had traded and smuggled diamonds and illegally harvest timber, but the exact source of his war chest remained murky. The State Department estimated in 1996 that he had as much as $75 million a year. In addition, he also received some support from sympathetic nations such as Liberia, excuse me, Libya, and Bono Fossil. But at the beginning of his insurrection, Taylor was a startup warlord with a growing army and a new need for revenue. Taylor explained the special importance of Firestorm resources while on trial for war crimes at the Hague. Once we captured her bell, we then made it clear to Firestorm Plantation Company they can no longer be permitted to exercise allegiance to the government of Monrovia, Taylor testified. It became that particular time our most significant principal source of foreign exchange. At one point, Taylor says that with Firestorm nearly one million to two million every six months. The cash kept in the building anchored banger by Taylor Finance Minister, since there was not yet a first national bank of Taylor land. As to how he used the funds, Taylor was transparent as an Enron footnote. The money purchased food, medicine, and different things, he said. Taylor said Firestone worried about him, worried about his dealings with him. Firestone did not want to get involved in a violation of the United States law, Taylor testified. To accommodate both concerns, Taylor said, he worked on a scheme with Firestone, right? He worked out a scheme with Firestone. The company provided rubber to Taylor officials who smuggled it out of Liberia and sold it in neighboring Ivory Coast. U.S. Embassy cables from 1990 collaborate Taylor's testimony about Firestone worries. In 1991, U.S. Embassy officials noted that Firestone was very concerned that Taylor was making demands which could result in the company violating the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, the law that bans American companies from paying bribes to foreign officials. Firestone was being remarkably cagey about his dealings with Taylor, one cable said. Taylor was also adamant that Firestone had never paid taxes to his rebel government. He did not pay taxes to the MPFL, he said in his testimony. That more however acknowledged that Firestone had indeed paid taxes such payments were entirely legal, he explained, because Taylor was the de facto government that controlled the Firestone plantation. Firestone did not pay off warlords or give money under the table, he said. There is nothing in the Foreign Corruption Practices Act that says you cannot pay warlords, Hatmore said. The law in effort says you cannot bribe. ProPublica and Frontline unearthed from the previously unreported records of Firestone payments to Taylor in a lawsuit filed in the country County Courthouse in Akron, Ohio. The documents with their green eye shade come from precision surprise from both Americans and Liberians. U.S. officials who served in my robe at that time that they had not heard of the payments. Ambassador Wayman Tedadown took charge of the embassy eight months after the Firestone Amendment was signed. During a recent interview in Washington, D.C., he shook his head in disbelief when he was shown a Firestone document based on the schedule of payments the NPRAG. It's kind of amazing that it's so broken down by columns, he said. If Firestone became Taylor's bankroll as a deliberate source of corporate decision, that's pretty disturbing, Taylor said. 
the other stuff about supplying the fuel and the communications, if that's really a, a, a desperate and monetary, is very dis, is deliberate and monetary, that is very disturbing. Sawyer, the former president of Liberia, was taken aback when he reviewed the documents in Monrovia recently. The aging ex-president reacted angrily, said he would recommend the current Liberian government look anew at Firestone Road in the Civil War. I think that is sad, if I'm not only troubled by it. I am angry at it, he said. The Liberian people deserve some explanation. This is complicity, he said. This is complicity. Brenda Holland served as one of the chief prosecutors at Taylor War Crimes Trial, an expert in international law. She exhausted herself trying to untangle Taylor finances. Even today, his source of funds remains a mystery. Hollis had never seen the documents either. She scoffed that Firestone uses the term taxes to describe payment to Taylors. You can call it taxes, but in my view, they were paying him to stay in business, Hollis said. They was dressing it up. The fix it, man. Firestone fulfilled the second promise to Taylor in May 1992. We had came out of retirement to take over management director of Firestone Plantation. A retired U.S. Air Force captain, he had wavy hair, easy gap to brand. He liked whiskey and had a big diamond ring. We had acted as Firestone fixing man before. He was a chemist and was not particularly experienced in operating the rubber firm. He did, however, have a very particular set of skills that required during his long career. He knew how to move around in political circles, we said. In the 1970s and 80s, he sold out the company Rampart Plantation, a separate one in Liberia. He managed to bargain with Samuel Doe to get a better deal on the company contract with Liberia. In the late 1980s, he ran the Firestone Plantation in the final turbulent years of Doe regime. We met Tedder when then the rebel leader was a newly minted bureaucrat controlling the money that lost to Doe's administration. We also befriended Richardson, Tedder's top advisor. Both men loved deep sea fishing. And what I can mean a scene from Graham Greene's novel, Expats and Liberian Angers Mixed at Firestone Fishing Club, a collection of wooden docks on 20 foot boats on a murky creek just outside of the entrance of the Firestone Plantation. I didn't sense any racism in them, we said, a, Richardson said, a we. He didn't have a plantation mentality. Although 65 years old and settled in retirement, we welcome the chance to return to Liberia. I felt I had a big responsibility for the plantation over there and the people there, we said. We was interviewed a few months before his death in 2010. In Firestone absence, Taylor had turned House 53 into his own personal White House, a place to retreat as he's cutting around the country for security reasons. A Firestone took a pair of meals for him. A Firestone repairman Fixed the hot water heater after Taylor complained the showers were too cold. Firestone workers cut the lawn by hand. He reveled in his power. He welcomed Dick and Lance, UN representative, even former President Jimmy Carter, who came to Liberia to work on the peace accord. Still, he liked what he saw on the plantation and with Taylor. My first impression with Taylor was that he might be a reasonable man, we said. He certainly spoke reasonable about how the beer should be changed and what should be done. What he said made sense. Taylor held up his end of the memorandum agreement. He appointed Brigadier General Domino Ramos, a mercenary from Gambia, to protect the plantation with 300 soldiers. Matt Chipley, a Ramos commander, said Firestone paid him $425 a month, gave him free fuel with 25 bags of rice. Taylor also ordered Ramos to recover looted Firestone equipment, machinery, and vehicles. Taylor and his ministers, homes and hills were off limits. So we and his crew set up a Spartan dormitory in the guest house of Firestone used to put up his visitors. As the first time arranged began, the expats worked to assess the damage to the plantation. At night, they could gather at communal tables for meals or rice and chicken. Afterwards, they relaxed to quick club beer, the local brew, and we drank whiskey from a small glass. Taylor visited the Firestone expats on several occasions. In the human guest house, he gave long speeches on democracy and the future of Liberia. He called him Mr. President, remember Brad Petty, the plantation controller? 
I actually felt there was an, if there's an election, he would be elected. I was impressed with the man. Occasionally, the expansion ran into roadblocks set up by rebel soldiers. They saw child soldiers roaming the grounds. A time when armed rebels raced the past. Should we have ways to resume Operation Penalty Acts recently? Probably yes, I agree with that. Probably better answer. But we decided that it was doable and we decided to try. We rehired thousands of Liberia to tap rubber trees. We built plantation building and turned back the jungle growth that threatened to overrun the plantation. As decreed by Taylor for all foreign companies working in Terran land, Firestone started paying workers half in Liberia and currency and half in US dollars, according to an embassy cable. As the US dollar circulated, they helped, help Taylor, helped provide Taylor government with a much needed liquid currency. We created a new transport system that allowed Firestone to use his support at Buchanan to export liquid latex, previously only possible through Monrovia. So now they're going to Taylor support in Buchanan and let the other government, you know, no money, no tax money, nothing like that. Taylor returned a favor. His port charged lower fees than the intern government levies in Monorium. The arrangement saved Firestone money, put cash in the Taylor's hands, and started Sawyer's interim government into badly needed revenue. It was a sweet deal for everyone involved. Firestone intent to make money, always has and always will, Petty said. Why did we go back? Because we felt sorry for the people that was there? Probably not. We wanted to get an investment, get that investment earning money again. So it was all about the dollar bill for them. Off limits. On a Langer summer day of 1992, filled with tension, almost two years had passed since the ceasefire. Both Sawyer and West African key peacekeeper were running out of patience. Taylor had kidnapped more than 500 West African soldiers. He was fighting pitch battle with a rebel faction invading neighboring Sierra Leone. We knew Taylor Fires was using the plantation in the station area. They rushed off to attack peacekeeping and government forces stationed in the Sheffield military base between Firestone and Morovia. They used the plantation more to more or less regroup and go down to Sheffield, we said. You can hear the cannons going off and the gunfire right on the plantation. You knew there was a war going on, said we. Taylor's rebels sometimes kicked Firestone workers out of their homes. In other cases, the rebels were Firestone employees working when they weren't warring. Elian, the son of the general's manager's cook, described the constant influx of fighters. It was absolutely anarchy because the rebels was all over the place with their guns. They were in Firestone through Mr. Weed, you know, lots of transportation. So most of these Firestone vehicles are owned by the rebels, Elian said. It was very bad. Expats and Liberians recall planes flying overhead in the middle of the night and landing at Robert Airports. That's outside the plantation entrance. A number of mysterious planes are landing at Roberts Airfield, bringing in God knows what, Gerald Ruff remembers. We didn't get anything off those planes. Convoys are picking up trucks, truncating them up the main road, carrying sea cargo deep into the shadows of the Firestone Plantation. And when the plane comes, you see the vehicles coming in covered there with tarping, and it seems to be weapons, you know, said Daniel D. Roberts, the secretary. The boys that were living with us in the camp say, our weapons will come. We and Taylor worked to set a communication center and a radio station in another senior manager's home nearby. According to a Firestone official in a deposition from Tono Wokwiki, Taylor Defense Minister, in January 1992, we gave a U of Embassy a tour, officials a tour of the research and plantation. He told them how Rainbow had deployed 300 soldiers to protect the operation, and then down a thousand or so rebels lived on the farm taking advantage of Firestone food distribution rebel so he told the officers. As the tour progressed, the groups chatted with Ramos. He seemed laid back and affable. Then they bumped into General Adolphus Dolo, better known as General Peanut Butter. He was infamous for recruiting child soldiers. After the tour, the embassy officials summarized in a visit in a lengthy cable to Washington. Firestone appears to want to play ball with the NPRAG and has appointed we to deal more effectively with the MPFL, MPRAG, over the long term, the cable said. Impressions from the plantation visit gave the, gave the feeling 
that Firestone management, both in Akron and on the scene, is determined to stay the course. It has a huge investment to protect and wants to make the plantation a profitable long-term operation. Firestone Senior has concluded that to be successful, they must deal with Charles Taylor now. There was one more thing we wanted the embassy to know. At some point, we pulled off on one of the embassy officers aside. The rebels had not permitted Firestone to venture to find some areas of the sprawling plantation, he said. Without elaborating, but given the impression there may be some military significance, we also mentioned that certain parts of the plantation was off limits. The embassy we kind of in the cable to Washington. Preparations on the plantations. On October 8th, 1992, the US, new U.S. Ambassador to Libya paid an official visit to Firestone Plantation. Had a down and his entourage traveled smoothly across 20 miles of Tarmac Road from the capital to the plantation. We provided the tour. There was great news. Firestone was back in business. For the first time since June 1990, Firestone would begin to in Liberia. 600,000 pounds in August, 3.9 million pounds in September. More than 6,500 uh, 6, 6, Liberians were back at work typing rubber trees. Buildings destroyed by the looter had been repaired. The company had managed to reopen Firestone Hospital. It's a pretty impressive, impressive installation, Ted I said. We got, I think, a pretty fair snapshot of what the operator is about and how it works. That was only partially true. By the day of Tanao visit, Taylor Man had cleared an unusual 25 robots manned by teenage rebels looking for bribes. Child soldiers had vanished from sight. Taylor himself was nowhere to be seen. Behind the scenes, although Taylor was overseeing the final stages of the preparation of Operation Octopus, an all out push to seize Monrovia and take control of Liberia. Soldiers mounted on heavy machine gun in front of House 53 for Taylor's protection. Taylor began spending most of his days at the plantation, he testified. On the farm, some experts said they noticed something different, he said. He had no idea that Taylor was planning an attack. John Chapman, a British expatriate who was production manager of the rubber processing plant, said he vaguely recalled an iron convoy passing through the plantation in days before the operation was launched. But he didn't think much of it. We was concentrating on getting the factory running. We were all pleased that it was running. During the tour, the U.S. Embassy contacts on the plantation quite frankly told the U.S. Embassy official that an airflow cargo plane had made a night landings and discharged freight at Tender Control Roberts Airport Base in early October, Cable said. The U.N. report will later test that the arm dealers from the former Soviet Union were among Taylor's chief weapon suppliers, including the notorious Victor Bout. Now, sidebar, um, Victor Bout, if you watch the movie um, with Nicolas Cage called The Lord of War, he played Victor Bout. You know what I'm saying? That's the guy they're talking about. He had a kind of a, a fruity off and on or a crazy relationship with Charles Taylor. You know? The dial noticed that the soldiers bore automatic weapons that were shiny, new, and, and apparently just out of the package crate, according to the cable. If Firestone actually noticed anything suspicious, their Liberian employees were more perceptive. A monsoon and the races had just given away the drier weather, and the air found the kind of electricity and a kind of energy and dread. A sharp blade scraping softly across up Liberia's neck. You could tell they were playing a lot of full-scale war. There were weapons moving around when they said we knew something was up. And we're gonna stop right there on the part three of Liberia. What happened with Firestone? What happened when they choose Firestone? Now you're seeing Firestone basically through now a Japanese-owned company. You know what I'm saying? Redstone Firestone, now a Japanese-owned company. It's applying, it's giving the guy the weapons because they're paying taxes and stuff like that. I had a memory of understanding. They're giving the guy weapons and stuff like that. You feel me? So they basically they basically extending the war. But as long as whoever's controlled the plantation, that's who they was rolling with. It wasn't no loyalty to the country per se. So you know, they basically extending the war. 
um, dealing with him, propped him up because they're making control governments. And the U.S. Embassy, as you're saying, they basically went along with it. You know what I'm saying? As I talked about in other things, America um, works for Firestone. You know what I'm saying? So it's all about the dollar bill and the dollar line to them. So they don't care who in charge. That's how I did this today working with. Anyway, this is a Koski of Fun Day. You know what I'm saying? Saying thank you for listening. This is part three. We're going to get down to part four because this is a important series that got to be talked about. I want to say thank you for listening. Hopefully you subscribe, hit the like button because that's what we're doing, dropping black history all day. And, um, you know, donate to the movement. Put something in the cash shop. You know what I'm saying? Because we're going to be doing this all day long. Peace and have a wonderful day.